Welcome to Ichthys Bible College. Whether you've been called into ministry or aspire to deepen your knowledge in the Word of God, Ichthys Bible College is the road to take. Our tutors offer you one-to-one support and in-depth teaching in person. But if coming in on site doesn't suit your schedule or location, simply sign up to our online course. Signing up is an easy process and our website can be accessed worldwide. It's easy to use and every module is clearly laid out with a study guide, quizzes and assignments. Our wide range of topics stretch from the Old to the New Testament in detail and explores the Bible's history and its relevance today. This course is the perfect tool to help deepen your knowledge and equip you to study the Word of God with a richer understanding. Whether you can join us on site or study from home, we hope to see you there. Welcome to the New Testament Greek course entitled, It's All Greek to Me. I believe that this course will give you a revolutionary insight into the reading and understanding of the New Testament in the Greek language. Agapao is translated to the word love. En archi in o logos. Ge o logos in proston theon. I am the bread of life. Welcome to Ichthys Bible College. Whether you've been called into ministry or aspire to deepen your knowledge in the Word of God, Ichthys Bible College is the road to take. Our tutors offer you one-to-one support and in-depth teaching in person. But if coming in on site doesn't suit your schedule or location, simply sign up to our online course. Signing up is an easy process and our website can be accessed worldwide. It's easy to use and every module is clearly laid out with a study guide, quizzes and assignments. 
Our wide range of topics stretch from the Old to the New Testament in detail and explores the Bible's history and its relevance today. This course is the perfect tool to help deepen your knowledge and equip you to study the Word of God with a richer understanding. Whether you can join us on site or study from home, we hope to see you there. Welcome to the New Testament Greek course entitled, It's All Greek to Me. I believe that this course will give you a revolutionary insight into the reading and understanding of the New Testament in the Greek language. Agapao is translated to the word love. En arhi in o logos. Die o logos in proston theon. I am the bread of life. Welcome to Ichthus Bible College. Whether you've been called into ministry or aspire to deepen your knowledge in the Word of God, Ichthus Bible College is the road to take. 
Our tutors offer you one-to-one -one support and in-depth teaching in person. But if coming in on site doesn't suit your schedule or location, simply sign up to our online course. Signing up is an easy process and our website can be accessed worldwide. It's easy to use and every module is clearly laid out with a study guide, quizzes and assignments. Our wide range of topics stretch from the Old to the New Testament in detail and explores the Bible's history and its relevance today. This course is the perfect tool to help deepen your knowledge and equip you to study the Word of God with a richer understanding. Whether you can join us on site or study from home, we hope to see you there. Welcome to the New Testament Greek course entitled It's All Greek to Me. I believe that this course will give you a revolutionary insight into the reading and understanding of the New Testament in the Greek language. Agapao is translated to the word love. En archi in o logos. Die o logos in proston theon. I am the bread of life. So faithful you are. Amen. God bless you, church. Let's give the Lord a mighty clap of praise. As we stand to our feet as well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord to stand before Him and to come together and to meet with Him this morning. We've got so much to be thankful for, so much given thanks for that He's brought us through this week and that. God is moving us on from glory to glory, from strength to strength. So we give him the praise and the glory. And we're going to lift up a song this morning. It says, as for me and my house. And the famous verse says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And that's what we've, that's what we've been called to do. To come and serve in the house of the, of the Lord this morning. And all the days of our lives. So we're going to give this service over to him. We're in, we're in anticipation and expectation for what God's about to do this morning. Are we ready? Amen. I'm not convinced that I've come to the right church. Are we ready? Amen. 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 So, as we're going to open up our service, let's just remind what the words of this song say, let our foundation be built on your majesty, and let every word you speak fill this home. Jesus, our cornerstone, the anchor for our souls, your glory will be shown by our love. And as for me and my house, we will serve you. Praise God. I just want to read that scripture before we come into this. And it's from Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. I'm going to read from 14 now. It says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's the, the scripture for this morning. Choose this day whom we will serve. And we've been brought out of darkness and into his glorious light. We too lived on the other side of the river. And each one of us served foreign gods. Because before we come to the Lord, 
We serve many different idols, perhaps unbeknown to us at the time, but we were once in darkness, and he had mercy on us, and he drew near to us. And unless the Father had called us, we couldn't be here today. And today we want to worship him, and glorify him, and lift him, and remember where he has brought us from, his faithfulness. We sung on Friday, I think it was Friday about how faithful God is. We have known him as a father. We have known him as a friend. And he's been good to us. We sung of the goodness of the Lord. And unless we had seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, we would have lost heart. But he has been with us. He has been faithful. He is beautiful beyond our comprehension. He's merciful beyond what we can ever imagine. We don't deserve his grace, nor his mercy. But he loves us and he pours it out. Every time we come together, he is in the midst of us. And I'm so thankful for ACC. I am so thankful for you as brothers and sisters that we are indeed a family of God. We have walked alongside one another. The greatest gift that God has given us is this dimension, is each other. You can have the wealth of Egypt, the wealth of the world, without a brother or a sister to lift up your hands. You have nothing. Praise God for Aaron on her in our lives. When Moses ascended the mount and Joshua was leading the battle, his hands also grew weary and they began to come down. And we know the scripture well. That when Aaron and Ur was called to the left and the right of Moses to lift up his hands, as they lifted up his hands, Joshua prevailed. And we need one another, church. Lean on me, the song says. Lean on me, you've got a friend in me. That's Lean on me when you're not strong. I'll be your friend and I help you carry on. And that's what the church is about. Maybe a worldly song, but that's the reality. Lean on your brothers and sisters. Find men and women that have faith to stand beside you, to ignite fire within you. No man is an island and we can't walk alone. So I wanna thank God for your lives. Thank God for the people that he's placed around you. Precious pearls. Seek out the faithful man. Watch his ways. God ordains the steps of the righteous. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve him. If we regret anything in this life, it's not going to be how much we serve God. It's not going to be how much we love or how much we forgave or how many times we turn the other cheek. If we regret anything in this life, when it's all been said and done, and we stand before him in glory, the regret will be that we didn't do enough, that we didn't glorify him enough, that we didn't allow the Holy Spirit to move us, to give him praise, to not be ashamed of the gospel, to speak out when it counts, and to love without measure. Pour yourselves out this morning in worship. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Thank God. Thank God that you can praise him this morning. And for those of you at home, he's been a good God, a good father, a good companion, merciful, kind and beautiful. And he deserves all the praise and all the glory. God bless you.
Morning, church. Good to be in the house of God this morning. Praise God. I know I am, especially after that as well. Um, we had a powerful word again on Friday about numbers. And I just wanted to share with you a, a psalm this morning from Psalm 66, verse 1. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Amen. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. And that's what we have done this morning, and that's what we'll continue to do, to sing praises to our God, praise God. So we're just going to take our time of offering. As you all know, Deacon Andrew's going to place basket in the front. If you'd like to uh, give your offering, it's just escort you row by row. You can come and place your offering, and the details will be coming up on the screen as well. So God bless you as you can.
of your cross and fix my eyes upon you, Jesus, for you are God and I am not. Oh, blessed assurance. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good at all times. Hallelujah, that we trust the victory of your cross. I thank you for this morning. That as for me and my house, as for me and my church, as for me and my home, we will serve you. We turn our eyes to you and let the cares of this world grow strangely dim. We thank you that we can trust what we cannot trace, that you will in the steps before us. We pray for our children, you know, from the youngest to the oldest, to those in the womb, to those, Father God, that are older now. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for their lives. We pray that your hand may be upon them, that you have a good future for them, a future and a hope for this generation. I thank you for their lives, Lord. I trace the bloodline around them, Lord, that they'll be protected and delivered that they too will know how to call upon you in the day of trouble, that you will always deliver them, or that they will hear you, Lord. We pray for our beloved Archbishop. As the song says about you, God, that we lifted up, we have known you as a father and known you as a friend. And the same goes true for our Archbishop. We have known him over the many years as a father and as a true friend. And I truly thank you for his life as he ministers and labors in word and doctrine. I thank you, God, that he has taught us to trust in you, to call upon you, and to love you with all of our hearts. And I pray a special blessing upon his life now this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's give him a clap of him as our special comes to share the word. God bless you. It's good to be here. Are you, are you blessed to be here? Praise God. Amen. You can, we can't touch each other according to the guidelines, but you can look around and see who's around you. Just turn around and see who's here today. God bless. Acknowledge each other in the house. Give a wave. A greeting. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here. I'd like to welcome Reverend Dr. Leo and his family, First Lady, and the lovely children. Let's... Give a little welcome again to the house, praise God. Also Bishop Noel with First Lady, let's just welcome them as well. And any other visitors, you are welcome. Any questions, you can see one of us at the end of the service. I hope I don't offend anyone today, but if I do, it's not intentional. <laughs> praise the Lord. I thought today we'll begin perhaps the service with maybe one or two testimonies because there's a few things been happening. And uh, I just want to give glory to God because it's, the church is about life. So I want to ask Zoe first to come up. Is Haley here? I'm sure it's Haley. So is here, won't you? If you ask Haley to come in as well. You give them a micro. We had an anointing service at the beginning of the year. I just want to share, let them share what the impact it has on our lives. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So if, uh, Zoe. Good morning, church. Good morning. Um, I'd like to begin just to say that if I never had this church, because I, I first met Bishop when I was 14 years old, and it had such a huge impact on my life, because I decided at that age to follow Jesus. And following Jesus has made such an impact on my whole life, and I don't think I could ever be the same. And this morning, as Pastor Penny was ministering about leaning on me, and you know, how we need to be strong, and we lean on Jesus, and when we lean on Jesus, that can have such an impact on someone else's life. Because that impact that you have is love. And love makes all that difference. And that love that I had for Jesus spurs me on to do things for others. And it spurred me on to, I know it's a natural thing to love your own mum, but it spurred me on to keep praying and praying and praying and being that person to stand in the gap for my mum. So when I saw my mum in the hospital, maybe three years ago, and I saw her broken, sick, riddled with cancer, I knew that I had to pray. I knew that I had to declare. I knew that I had to try. And I, I, I just remember that scripture. I think it's um, 118 verse 17, I think it is. And it says, you shall not die, you shall live. And I will declare the works of the Lord. I, I think that's what it says and what it states and I said I've got to declare this over my mum I've got to have some boldness that I believe in that my Lord Jesus Christ that he lives that he is able and he can do all things 
And if I just lean on Jesus, then he can do it. And for three years, I saw my mum be disabled. I saw her not walk. I saw her not be able to do anything. I saw her lose faith. I saw her lean on Jesus. And I saw her walk. And I thought, Lord, you know, I know that you can do it. And then Bishop gave a little anointed earbud. And I, said, I heard the Lord say to me, you've got to get one for your mum. You've got, to, you've got to anoint her. So I went home and I phoned my mum and I asked her, I said to her, Mum, can I anoint you? And she wasn't too, she was like, yeah, okay, maybe, you know. So I waited and I prayed and I waited and seven days later she said, yes, you can come, you can anoint me. So I went to her house and I anointed her. I put the cross, because the cross is where, where it, our help comes from. And I said, in the name, and I anoint you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, and I left it in God's hands. But my mum went for a scan in the hospital and she came back and she said, Zoe, I can't believe it. The doctor said the cancer's gone. Wow. And she had two lesions in her spine. And they, were, they, were, they weren't small lesions, they were big lesions in her spine and she had it in a hip. And before that even, it started to disappear. And I, and I mean, it was rather big. And she can walk, she's walking around, she's healthy, she's doing well, she's leaning on God. And I can see her faith is being renewed. And I, and I said to her, I, I just couldn't believe that the, the cancer had disappeared from her spine. This is the power that we have in Jesus. It is, and I will declare the works of the Lord because Jesus is real. He's not fiction. He's not something of our imagination. He's not something that we stand up here today and we sing and we're just singing to some empty vessel. This is Jesus. He's real. He exists. And I'm telling you because I will declare the works of God. He is real. He is able. And even if, you know, everything doesn't work out the way you expect it to, still lean on God. Because he is still Jesus. And he is still King. And he is still Lord. And I will stand. I pray to God that I still walk in that faith. And I pray that I walk stronger and stronger. Not in my own strength, but in God's strength. And that is what I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. For everybody here in this church today. Amen. God bless you, Zoe. Praise the really encourage you. So we hear so much bad news around. It's good to hear some good news. Yes. Praise God. I mean, it's, uh, Hayley, is she here? Where's Hayley? Check come to the front as well. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful God works in so many amazing ways. It's powerful, really moving, emotional, how God is touching people's lives. Even at these times, when the world is in disarray, confusion, God is still enthroned Amen. and still in control. Hayley's got a testament as well. It's been some time we've been discussing certain things, but I'll let Hayley share herself. Morning, church. Um, so, March 2019, um, I started to get a small blister on my left hand. Thought nothing of it, really. Um, but over time, it then spread through pretty much all of my hand. Then it moved to the right of my hand and then onto the left foot. Um, I went to the doctors, then nothing was working. Um, so over time I was getting frustrated because visually it didn't look great, it was blisters, it was skin was peeling off, it was red raw um, and um, then on my foot, my foot would swell up um, so I couldn't wear a shoe so there was times I'd go to work and I'd have to have one shoe, couldn't wear the other one and it was just really bothering me um, and so to cut the story short, so in Obviously, during lockdown, I was getting more and more frustrated with it because it just wasn't wasn't going. Um, so in January, when Archbishop gave us the anointing oil, um, uh, the I took it home, and it was at that point where I kind of had made a decision that I had to let the Lord of my faith. The bud had to go onto the hands, and I knew then that the Lord would heal my hands. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to explain it, but during lockdown, um, and I thank God for lockdown, even despite on what's going on, because personally for me, um, I had decisions to make with my faith. Um, you know, I, I can borrow faith from people, and at times we do, 
But there comes a point in an hour when the Lord wants a personal relationship with you. Amen. And, yes. Amen. you know, looking at my hands and the frustration and, you know, it stopped me doing things that I wanted to do. I couldn't run because of my foot. Um, but it made me, like, look at the things that I was probably putting ahead of the Lord, like distractions that I wasn't really committing myself to, to my faith. Um, so, you know, January when the oil came, I was like, I had to sit there and I just had to really, you know, really believe that the Lord would. And we can say we believe, but I had to go home that night and I remember just crying because okay, it's all good. Um, and so um, I sat there and I was like, Lord, I really want to commit my life to you. Like, I really want to commit my life to you. I don't, I don't want to just come to church and hear the word and, you know, Sunday be on fire for the Lord and then Monday, Tuesday it goes down. So... Um, I put the oil on my hands, um, and then since then, you know, there's been such a healing that like you can see. Amen. There was, wow. um, it's really it's, it's, um, you know, it's the physical healing that you can see, but the Lord has done a work in me through that oil, um, and just that, you know, there's so much distractions out there, but. You know, my heart is for the Lord, and you know, it's the it's the hour, it's the time, um, more than ever now, that you know we always hear it, but it is truly time to be the light because you know there is so much darkness out there, and yes. physical healing does go. But you know, I thank the Lord for the oil that I placed. It was on my hands, but for me, it was in my heart. Like Amen. it sounds so cliche, but it's true. Like I had to. You know, the, the, the hand represented so much frustration, and it could be um, covering probably frustrations that I had in other areas of my life. And you know, I thank I thank the Lord for our church, for Archbishop, for for the powerful words that have come out since January, um, because God is truly moving, and you know, it's it, it really is time to move. So I thank the Lord for for the healing. <laughs> Thank you, Haley. God bless you. It's good sometimes to see what happens, the continuation outside of the church in your personal lives, how you walk, how you live, how you express your faith around within your homes and your community and your families. Because it's all well and good we come to church for a couple of hours on a Sunday or Friday. But how are we living our lives separate to that, that we should be continuing the relationship with the Lord, the relationship with God and your connection with God doesn't stop when we go to work. You know, sometimes we go to work and we put God in the closet and we take him out when we want. God is not in the box. We need to let God be permeate every aspect of our lives, which is one that we need to believe. Faith, believe in people, praise God. And you know, before I come to the message for today, when the Lord was ministering in Israel at the time of his mission of the of the incarnation, the physical ministry of Jesus, there was areas he didn't perform miracles. Men, not many miracles. And the reason why the Bible tells us is because of the lack of the faith of the people. They didn't believe in him. And God will not force his miracles, his blessing on your life. If you don't want God's blessing, he's not going to impose it on you. He wants you to be open. He invites us. He doesn't gate crash. He doesn't force anything on us, good, bad, or indifferent. He's there for us if we want him. He's just a prayer away. When Peter was drowning in the sea of his fear, he just said, Lord, help me. And the Lord just grabbed his hand and put him back on the boat. Something to safeguard him. So just pray to God. Start believing. Look, look at the word, but look at it as a living word. You know, it's like when you're thirsty. And you're, you know, when it's so hot and you're thirsty and you, you've the first gulp of water, you have to start to quench your thirst. How good does that feel? Well, you know, your soul, your spirit is also uh, thirsty. There is a dryness and we need to draw from the Spirit of God to quench our spiritual thirst. That's what the Lord conveyed to the Samaritan woman. He said, the water you drink, you're going to thirst again. But the water I give you will be a well within you. Oh. Amen. And that's, that's the connection that Zoe has with the Lord, that Haley has with the Lord, that people of God have with the Lord, that the Amen. ministers have with people today. And I thank God, the fact that you are here today is a miracle. The fact that we are so active as a ministry in the midst of all the mayhem that's happening, it's a miracle. Amen. After the service today, I'm ordaining three ministers. God's work has not stopped because there's a lockdown. Praise God. Sometimes we need to be locked down for God to move. 
So praise the Lord. So God bless you. Our message today is taken from the Gospel of John. The foundational passage is the Gospel of John, chapter 5. I want to read a few verses. Let's stand together for this. Verse 1, and I will say when we finish the, the reading, praise the Lord. So be excited, be receptive. Say, Lord, what do you want to say to me today? Don't observe how I express the word, or how I articulate the word. Look at the primary verses of the word of God, because God is the miracle worker, not myself. We're just a vessel to say, here is the Lord, you connect to him. But the, 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 the Zoe and Haley and what were saying earlier on is that personal relation that really is of importance. So let's go to the Gospel of John chapter 5 verse 1. You've probably read this passage many times, but I want to read it with a different facet, have a different outlook, and draw some deeper significant lessons from this passage. Just take this passage very quickly. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Verse now a certain man was there who had an infirmity eight, 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already, he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise take up your bed and walk and immediately the man was made well and took up his bed and walked and that day was the sabbath praise the lord thank god for his reading please take your seats in life if we don't want to be disappointed we have to lower our expectations if you don't want to be disappointed lower your expectations detach yourself from an outcome don't rely on anyone, ultimately, but God. But don't put great pressure and expectation on people because you will be disappointed. People were disappointed with regards to Jesus. And if Jesus could be the object of someone's disappointment, you've got no chance. He was sinless, he was without sin. What we do, we put people on pedestals, and then we want to knock them down when they don't adhere to our expectation. The man's response to Jesus' question, which was a strange question for Jesus to ask in a place, is in the same, we can parallel this, if you go to a doctor's surgery and you ask someone in, in the waiting room, do you want to be made well? It's out of context, out of place. The, 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 the response would be, well, why would I be here if I don't want to be made well? You go to the doctor to get... Uh, examined and you know uh, see what the problem is and give your medication and all these things and then you go away think you've, you've, achieved, you've achieved something so it's a strange question out of place and out of time out of context that Jesus asked this man the man's response is not to say yes it's to start complaining and when we have a challenge in life we can embrace the challenge and look face on and move on and, and adapt and try to overcome the challenge, or we can procrastinate, sit back, and want to blame everyone else why we have a challenge. So that's why, if you want to, if you do not want to be disappointed, I'd suggest you don't you lower your expectations, and that's that's the human condition. Hum, hum, humanity, at the best of times, attributes with blame to someone else or something else why they haven't progressed. Why haven't they achieved what they expected, wanted to achieve? It's always not my fault, somebody else's problem. And the paralyzed man used other people to complain why he's still paralyzed, why he's, he's in that condition. I say, I have no man. In fact, this is a common response. You'll encounter it perhaps oftentimes in your lives. People will always be complaining about someone. 
Has anyone ever gossiped to you about someone else? No, not in this church. <laughs> Has anyone complained about someone else? Why? They could have been, should have been, would have been if it were not for this individual or this person. Or if it weren't for their parents or their family or their friends or their neighbour or their employer. Isn't it the case? Even, even at the best of times, the best of people often complain. Everyone was to blame someone else. Why they haven't achieved, why they're in the condition, why they're in the situation. It's somebody else, it's my ancestry, it's genetics. <laughs> Martha and Mary had similar attitudes. Martha and Mary, when their brother had died, and they called for Jesus, he delayed two days, he came four days late, which he was on time, and Martha said to me, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, it's your fault. <laughs> Mary echoes the same, response in the same way, if you had not been here, my brother would still be alive. Ultimately, Jesus, it's your fault. Attribute all the blame at the feet of Jesus. Yeah. But Jesus is the solution, not the problem. Right. Yeah. And sometimes we're short-sighted, we cannot see beyond our own complaints and our own limitations. And this is what comes out within this passage, that this individual has been 38 years in this condition, and for 38 years he's complaining, wallowing, complaining, having self-pity in his condition. And we're told there's a mention of an angel coming at a particular time, stirring the water, and whoever enters first is healed of whatever infirmity they have. Interestingly, that the fact that they mention the angel there, that the angel comes down at a certain time means there is angelic manifestation, angelic movement in the world around us. And oftentimes we don't see angels moving around. You know this UFO phenomenon that we're seeing around? Everyone has seen a UFO, or everyone has seen an alien, or some, of, of one type or another. You have, you have uh, close encounters of the first, second, third, and the fourth kind that you have a physical connection with an alien. Let me tell you, when you encounter God, you have a, a, a close encounter of the fifth type of the spiritual type. Amen. And oftentimes people confuse a angels as aliens. This angelic manifestation, but you're conditioned to think in certain ways and you interpret things in relation to your preconceptions and the conditioning that's been put into your mind, how you've been taught to think. When you see something, you try and fit it in the box of your past references because you cannot see anything new because you've been limited by the conditions around. I wish I'm speaking to someone today. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise God. So this man is arguing, saying, I have no man when the water stirs to put me and help me. Everyone passes me, leaves me behind. Amazingly, Jesus singles him out because God leaves no one behind. Amen. There's an old saying in the army, leave no man behind. When you go into war, territory, terrain, and you execute your mission, you're not supposed to leave a man behind. Even if it's at risk of your own life, leave no man behind. And God will not leave no one behind. When David was in the my horrible pit and the miry clay, God did not leave him behind. Oh, I wish I'm speaking to someone. When God's people were in Egypt captives, he did not leave them behind. He intervened and he afflicted Egypt to let his people go. God leaves no man behind. If you are behind, it's because you're not following the lead of God. He says, follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. I give you the power to follow me if you decide in your heart and you resolve in your heart you want to follow me. I will not leave no one behind. God is not going to leave anyone in hell who chooses him. People say, well, why would God send people to hell? God doesn't send no one to hell. It's, it's, the decision is in our hands. We need to get out of hell because this world is a hell. And he came into the hell of our lives to get us out of hell. Get us out of here, praise God. Hallelujah. You see, so this man says he had complaints. I have no man. When the water stirs, when the angel comes down, there's no man to help me, praise God. And it's a complaint. He says, well, look, you've got, it's within you. Stop complaining. Get up. Take up your bed and walk. And sometimes we can do little simple things that change our whole life. Our destiny changes. But a decision we can make today can change your destiny. 
You may be wallowing whatever it metaphorically is representing in that bed he was lying. What complaint, what excuse we have. We can change our whole lives by changing the way we see the situation. Know that this situation is not empowering, is not above us. We can be above the problem, not beneath the problem. I wish I was speaking to someone. You see, God himself in the scripture finds himself in the same condition as the man who has no man to help him. Come on. God searched the four corners of the world seeking a man to stand in the gap and he found no man. And God could have used the same complaints. But what did God decide to do? He said, I'm going to do it myself. Amen. I don't have a man, but I'm going to do it myself. Amen. You have to be, sometimes become your own hero. Yes. Yes. Sometimes you have to redefine yourself as a stand up and be the superman or superwoman that, that you can be to overcome whatever challenges you face in life. Sometimes you've got to deep, deepen yourself and, and make the decision. I've got to rise. If, I'm not going to rely on anyone. I'm relying on myself and ultimately God. Praise Amen. God. Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30 says this. This is God saying, so I sought for a man. This man said in the poor of the poor, I have no man. God is saying, I have no man. Watch this. Says, so I sought for a man among whom, them whom would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy. But I found no one. So what was, what was, how did the Lord, how, what was God's response to not finding a man? His response was this, Isaiah tells us 59 verse 16, watch what God says about the situation of finding any man. Watch this. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. God could not find anyone to do it for him, so he had to do it himself. I wish I'm speaking. And his own righteousness, it sustained him. And verse 17 says, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. God did it himself. He took the garments of flesh. See, Jesus Christ was a man, but he was God. He was human, but he was divine. His humanity identified with us. But if he just, if it was just on the human domain level, he couldn't save us. He had to have divinity element within his makeup to facilitate our salvation and our reconciliation and our travel and rising above our own limitations, weaknesses, and fears. I wish I'm speaking to someone. But God at no time wallows in self pity, but transcends these emotions. He's above emotion of the human limitation. And that's why he can achieve something. When we can cut off the culturing of our emotion, of our failures or our past, we can do something amazing, ex extraordinary, where we embrace the promises and, and, and the impact what God can have in our lives. You can do amazing things if you can cut the cord strings of your past. I wish I'm speaking Amen. to someone. Because it's the cord strings of the past that hold us back. For 38 years, that man used the same excuse. It's like a broken record. Be careful of people that you see oftentimes and they repeat the same narrative. Be careful. When I was studying NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which helps people change their outlook in life and motivates them to do something better, one of the key rules of that, of Neuro Linguistic Programming is you not, do not talk about the narrative. Don't focus on the problem, look at the solution. And it's a, it's, a, it's a biblical principle to look at solutions or problems. Jesus didn't say, like, I want you to explain, you know, when you want to come follow me, I want you to explain your whole past. Narrate to me what you did up to the point I've met you. Keep repeating, regurgitating, regurgitate. If you regurgitate it, you resurrect the emotions that were connected to the past that stopped you achieving the thing in the first place. So stop speaking about it. Speak about something new. There's a new day for you. There's a new horizon for us. This is the 31st day of the first month of the new year. Praise God. We've survived this month. Amen. There's so much good things to look ahead to. Where we can look through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of the vision that God's instilling in each one of us. Can change things in a powerful way. Praise the Lord. Amen. Isaiah 63 verse 5 says this. Watch this. 
I want to take you somewhere today, and if you embrace this, there is, there's, uh, God is a God of miracles. But the miracle for you might be just a smile. Amen. There's some people who cannot smile. Tomorrow's Monday, if they can't get on a train, you see so many depressed people. Going to a job they don't want to go to. Wishing the week away, wishing their life away. But God gives you a reason and a cause to smile. That might be the miracle. That might be the, it's not something big. They don't, don't want to move mountains. Have a smile. The joy of the Lord becomes your strength. Look, a smile may, doesn't cost anything, but it can get you everything. If I was an employer, I don't want my staff to come in there doom and gloom. They're formed up. No, 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 come back to work today. <laughs> can you do this road after doing the work? You know, I'm complaining all the time. Do it with joy, run, do it, and you may be promoted. I'm not going to promote someone who's doom and gloom, death warmed up. I'm going to demote them, not promote them. Come on. That's what it's about. Praise God. It says this, I looked, but there was no one to help. And sometimes you may feel in this situation. You look and there's no one to help you. Help comes from sometimes the most unusual, strange place. The least sometimes help comes from places you do not expect help to come from. Sometimes help does not come from the nearest and dearest. Sometimes help comes from a far distant place, a far distant land, uh, the heavenly domain. That's where the help sometimes comes from. Psalm 121 says this, verse 121 says this. Watch this, this is powerful. It says this, it says, I will lift up my eyes to, to the hills. From whence comes my where does the help come? Verse 2, watch this. Watch this. Uh, uh, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Oh. So Isaiah tells me, just come back to Isaiah 65 very quickly. Because I want to move, I want to take you to a special place for you. It says, Isaiah 65, 63, verse 5. Sorry, it says this. I looked, but there was no one to help. If you feel in this situation, let me tell you, you've got more help than you think. There are more for you than those against you. And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation for me and my own fury, it sustained me. Wow, it's powerful. And this is this is follows on from where it says in verse one, I'm just going to, this is interesting to have some biblical hermeneutics and exposition to this passage, because who is this who comes from Edom with, with dyed garments of, from Bosra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Watch this verse. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one treads, the one who treads in, in the white? This is about the Lord's coming for the sacrifice, to, to, to offer himself as a living sacrifice for you and for me, praise God. Amen. Speaking of the crucifixion, verse 3 says this, watch. I have trodden the winepress alone. Alone. God brought salvation for us alone. He had no help, no assistance from any human entity to help him to bring salvation for us. He did it alone. He was alone. But he didn't complain in that loneliness. He empowered. He prevailed in that loneliness because of love. He says, he says and from the peoples of no one was with me. He was on the cross alone. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I have stained all my robes. This is the blood pouring from Calvary. That's a stain he received. And this moves on to verse 5, which says this. It says, I looked, but there was no one to help. So you, if you feel there is no one to help, you are in good company. Oh, hallelujah. Praise. You are in good company. You know, the thing is, there was no one physically to help, but let me tell you, you'll always have spiritual assistance. You'll always have spiritual intervention. I'm telling you, I know that from my own experience. When every door was closed, God opened doors that no one can shut. Uh, it was lovely on Friday night, the, on Friday evening we, we, were doing the Bible, we were having a Bible study, and I had a minister here, Reverend George from Milton Keynes. And I was consecrated as a bishop in 2001, 5th of May 2001, in Alexandra Palace. And my first person I, I ordained was Reverend George. 20 years, how many years now? 20 years? 21 years, 2001, 20 years. And he was the first place, and he's come after 20 years, and he's just going through the process now of being consecrated as bishop, and again, I'll be consecrating him as bishop. 20 years of a relationship 
people, marriages don't last that long. They should do, but unfortunately... <laughs> you know, 20 years, a journey, consistency. But the reason I'm saying this is for all these years, I've been in ministry over 30 years, and, 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 I, and I've seen God move in ways that will blow your mind. Things that shouldn't happen, that happen. God does things that it will amaze you. God can never stop surprising us with his love and his intervention. But we need to trust on him. I remember I was going to the miracles, like the miracles that were shared today, the in, impact of God, Zoe and Haley, and other testimonies that we're having coming through on a regular basis. I remember I went to a hospital to pray for an individual, and the doctors and nurses said to me, that person has only got 24 hours to live. So I said, we're going to trust in God. We prayed. But by the next day, he was sitting on his bed, and it was, it was discharged within two, three days. Amen. And people think, well, you know, why did some people die and some people live? And that's not, I, I'm not here to answer those questions. All I'm here to do is to pray, and if God, how God moves, I give it, I'm here to give him the glory. Whatever happens, is Jesus said, not thy will, not my will, thy will be done. God has a plan. I can't, I can't uh, uh, second guess God's plan and I can't interfere with God's plan. If it's God's plan to take, he will take him or he will take her. Whatever, however I pray, it will not, it will not change. If God wants to do something, he will achieve it for his reason. All I need to be faithful is to, in my prayer life, my relationship with him. And that's for you as well at the same time. Praise God. Hallelujah. So Jesus encounters this man. The man complains, I have no man. Jesus says, I'm in the same boat. I have no one. Jesus could have sat down and compared their problems or their challenges, whatever the case is. But Jesus said to him, look, just take up your, get up, get, take up your bed and come on, just get out of the way you're blocking the gown way. Come on, just get out of the way. You've been lying there. How long have you been lying there? Come on. Are you paying rent for where you're lying there? Well, just... <laughs> But he says, I have no man. But interestingly, the, the question he asked, the statement he made, the answer to that was found in the mouth of Pontius Pilate. The answer to that man's question of saying, I have no man, the man that he needed, the answer to that was found in Pontius Pilate's mouth. In the Gospel of John chapter, in the same Gospel, chapter 19, verse 5, Pontius Pilate First of all, re resisting, reluctant to, to sentence Jesus to be crucified because he knew there was no fault, no, that he was, there was no fault in him. Watch this. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Amen. So I have no man. This is the man. Amen. I've become man. That you, you cannot use that excuse anymore. Because the man has come. I am the man. You know, they were saying, you're the man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's the man. He's become idu or anthropos. And I love the way the Greek phrases it. It says idu or anthropos. It says the man, not a man. He's the man. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So you see... He is the man that's come to meet us in our place of despair, in our place of struggle, in our challenges. He's come wherever you are. He's the man that's going to step into your situation and change your situation. The only reason he can change your situation is because he's not only the man, he's the son of God. Amen. I wish I was speaking to someone. And you know, they understood that when, when Jesus said, I am, God is my father, they, they translated it or defined it in terms of, for him to say, God is my father, it makes him, makes him equal with God. In, in, in John chapter 5, verse, verse 18, this is what they, they're asking the man after he's been healed on the Sabbath, who actually healed you? Uh, therefore, they, therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, not only because he, he, he only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So they understood the implication for them was to say that God is your father makes you weak with God. Okay. 
So the truth, the truth is parallel. Okay? Let me explain something to you. Why the devil doesn't like you. When you say, Our Father, who art in heaven, what does that make you? And by the reasoning of the Jews, the implication is this. If you say God is your Father, it puts you in a position. No, no, you're not getting, you're not getting. This is why people are too used to 4.2 bit sermons, particularly they don't understand the power of the gospel. Jesus said to the disciples, greater works than I, you will do. When you identify with me, he who is in, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. When you say God is my father, you embrace your divine identity. You're restored back to the place you were before you had fallen in the Garden of Eden. You become back in the image and likeness of God because you are God by grace, but not God by nature. And being God by grace, you are in creative power. You are forced to be reckoned with in the spiritual realm. Amen. Yes. So we wallow in our problems and our complaints and we need to stand up and step up to the plate and say, I'm a child of God. No power can overtake the divinity that's in within me. And that's why the apostle Paul says, imitate me just as, as I imitate Jesus Christ. That's why miracles were flying from them, from the apostles, because they embraced their identity with God, their relation with God, their father, meant that they had to have something, uh, an element of, of what the father of in within them. And the element we have is the power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Hallelujah, praise God. The man. So today I want to encourage you. Do not put your trust in the flesh. In the things of the world. Don't have expectations. Or place expectations of people. Who in reality. It's unfair. They will not live up to your expectations. Because we have double standards. We have a standard for everyone else. And a standard for us. Often time you see, oh, you're a church minister, so I have this great expectation on you. Then there's me, no, you got it all wrong. Being a Christian, we all have the same, it's a blanket expectation before God. Well, I, my standard must be your standard, and your standard must be my standard. That's, that's the way it works in the Bible. Does it, God doesn't consider saying, you're a bishop, you're a preacher, but you're just a believer. Oh, don't worry, you can, you, you've got that area element of, of making faults or doing things that are not right but he can't and he does you've got to criticize him but he cannot criticize you or this it doesn't work like that we all we all share the same responsibility yeah and that's that's where we're coming from you see so 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 don't put your trust in in the flesh or in the worldly limitations because you will be disappointed yes. we we vote people into office presidencies and and and, and different place of responsibilities. No sooner do we vote them there, then we start complaining about them. Because they don't live up to our expectation. Because you can please some of the people some of the time. You please them some of the people most. But you cannot please all the people all the time. Even God cannot do this. But just because you don't please people, it doesn't de de demote who you are in God. Or, or remove your position or your status in God. It just means that, that ultimately... You're, you have a path, your own journey. Oh. So you need to trust in the Lord. So don't put your trust in things limited that will disappoint you. This is why Psalm 118 verse 8 says this. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So the man says, I have no man. You don't need a man. You've got me. God becoming man. Yeah? That's what we have. We have God in man. We have the man Jesus Christ, who is divine at the same time, praise God. And verse 9 says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes, even in powers, authorities in the world. I don't put my confidence, I don't have expectations that the government's going to solve all the problems. And, and it'll be carefree life. It's not going to happen. If, you, if you're that mind, if you're that way wired up, you need to change your wiring. The world has never satisfied the powers that be have not satisfied people since the beginning of creation. Yeah? 
Jeremiah tells us this, goes further. He says this, 17 verse 1. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man. That's quite strong. <laughs> cursed is the man who trusts. Yeah, we have a relationship, but if my only my trust, my expectations are on a particular person or institution, so I will be disappointed. And makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Don't trust. And Psalm 20 verse 7 says this. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Do you want to go a bit deeper? I know there's children now, I hope I'm not. We're going to have Sunday school soon as well. <laughs> Coming back. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I want to take you on a little journey to close today, off the back of uh, John chapter 5, about not putting your trust in man. Now I want to take you back into history. I want to go back about 7th century BC. And I want to look at the life, I want to highlight and amplify, magnify the life of a king called Hezekiah. 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 The word Hezekiah means Yahweh makes one make, makes me strong. Okay? And Hezekiah was a king of Israel. And his prophet, his side, his prophet that helped him navigate was Isaiah the prophet. And you cannot get better than that. Isaiah mm -hmm. the prophet the prophet saw the Lord lifted on high and saw his robe filled the temple. He was powerful in the Lord as a prophet. And in fact, the gospel, the, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah is called the fifth gospel because it narrates the birth of Jesus right through to the crucifixion, resurrection, and coming back in glory. It's the fifth gospel. It's the gospel before the gospels. And this king had, a, they had, the, they had the, the other empires uh, coming against them. And one of the empires at the time was the, the Syrian Empire. They invaded the north in 722 to 27 BC and took them captive in, 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 in the north, northern realm. And uh, the kings wanted to destroy, come to Jerusalem and destroy, take over the city of Jerusalem, the heart of, of the kingdom of Israel at that time. And the king of Assyria was called Sennacherib. He was the king of Assyria. But Hezekiah was the king of Judah, of the king of uh, Jerusalem. And as the narrative unfolds, they fortify themselves within, within Jerusalem. I'm just going to give a quick narrative, a quick overview before I come to that, what, what I want to share. And they fortify everything, and they cut off the water supply, so when the Assyrians come in, they won't have water to quench their thirst. And they wanted to destroy all the supplies. So if they do overtake Jerusalem, they won't have any, any supplies to sustain them. And this narrative is going on, coming from uh, Second Chronicles chapter 31 going to 32. You can read this whole for your, your spiritual homework for the week. And it begins by saying, the narrative in 2 Chronicles 31 verse 20 says this, begins by saying this. And this is what, it, you're going to see how it relates to us, because the scripture must relate to us. Watch this. It says this. Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God. What he did, he removed every idol, every high place. They were worshipping secondary places of worship. The Israelites and the people of, of, of Israel were worshipping other heathen gods and things. He removed all these landmarks and all these shrines and all these places. And so he restored his people back to worshipping the true and living God, which is Yahweh Elohim. Okay? Did that. And he pleased God. So what's the implication for us? If we want to start preventing our spiritual journey, we need to take all the idols from out of our hearts that God will be pleased with us. Every distraction we have away from the true God, we need to get rid of it and start focusing on the true and living God and it will be pleasing to God. And when you're pleasing to God, he'll fight your cause. I wish I could. Come on, come on. And so verse 21 says this, And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandment to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. So he prospered. So you serve God with all your heart, you will prosper. The implication is scientific, spiritual science. You will prosper, praise God. Amen. And so the thing is that, so the king of Assyria is coming to overtake Jerusalem, but the king of Assyria had a multitude army, a massive army to come against Israel. All that Hezekiah had, a few soldiers if you like, a few choice men and women, and all he had, the most, but the most important thing he had, 
asset he had was his relationship with God. And when you have a relationship with God, it doesn't matter if an army camp against you, they will not prevail against you. If you have a relationship with God, I wish I'm speaking to someone today. Okay, praise God. Now, in, in 32 verse, he says this, he consulted he, with his leaders and commanders to stop the water from the springs, which were outside the city, and they helped him. Thus many people gathered together to, and who stopped all the springs and the brook that run fr- through the land saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? So they stopped the supply. So when the kings come and the armies come, they will not be able to quench their thirst. Because why? He cut that external water. He cut off that objective water. But what he did not cut off is the subjective water, the living water that flows through with, which in, in, in each one of us. Praise God. I wish I was speaking to someone. And this is what the the prophets are saying. We need to draw from the wells of salvation that come from our own system from within. Because the kingdom of God is within you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So that's, that's the attitude that the king had. Amen. So as we read on, we discover that as the narrative unfolds, that the king of Assyria wants to come and take over and control Jerusalem. But Hezekiah calls the people in the courtyard and says this, makes this declaration. And this is what I want you to to think of just for the moment. 2 Chronicles chapter 32 verse 7, watch this. It says, be strong and courageous. And this is what I was saying to the people watching the live stream and to everyone here today. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria. You may have a problem that we can translate as the king of Assyria. You may have a financial problem. You might have a family problem. You might have a physical ailment. You might have something that you're challenged with today. Do not be afraid of that situation. The king of Assyria, whatever it represents, the king of Assyria represents to you. Let me just, let's just read on. Nor before all the multitudes that that is with him. Whatever things are coming, do not despair. Hold tight, hold on. For they are more with us than with them. There are more with us than with them. What does he talk? What does he mean by this? There are more spiritual ranks with us than there are with them. Watch this, watch this. With him, with he, him is an army of flesh. Watch this. But with us is the Lord our God. Whatever problems you're facing, do not look at your problems and get confused by your problems. Be distracted by just you need to just focus on the Lord and let him deal with the details. I wish, no matter however the odds are stacked against you, you look to God and let God deal with the details. I wish I was speaking to someone. right? Uh, he says, we, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Amen. So why are you fighting battles that you're not called? Is they're not your battles? The battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. If he has saved you, he will sustain you. Watch this. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and fight and to fight our battles. And the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And I pray today the words are going to strengthen you. Praise the Lord. Now the king of Assyria was blaspheming against God and saying no God has ever been able to stand against the power of the Assyrians. The the first mistake he made. Yeah. He says no God, no God of any land. And these fools think that their God is going to stop me from overtaking, achieving my, 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 my goal, my, my objective. It's not going to happen. He, that's the mindset of the flesh. Pride brings a great fall. Watch this. Amen. And so what happens is, I want to just, I want to just show you this very quickly. Watch this. This, what, this is, you know, the angel came down in John, in the Gospel of John chapter 5. He comes down and stirs the water. And the first person who enters the water uh, is healed. Angels move continually on different levels, in different ways around the world and around people's lives. And sometimes an angel, you've had an encounter with an angel, but you have not known it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Welcome your eminence, Archbishop. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. It says, let love, uh, brotherly love c- continue. Verse 2 says this. Do not forget to ent- entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. There are angels interacting with us, and sometimes we don't know it. I wish I'm speaking to you. Watch this, watch this, watch this. So, he said, no power can come against me. The fatal mistake he made. 
Because he was not dealing with a power, he was meeting with the, he was dealing with the creator. Okay, watch this, watch this. So in 32, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 20, watch this. Now because of this king Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried out to heaven. We're speaking about prayer last week. Let me tell you, when someone of, of the category, the caliber of Isaiah prays, let me tell you, he cannot, but God cannot move when an Isaiah prays, something begins to happen. Oh, you have to have an Isaiah attitude in prayer and something will happen. Watch this. Then the Lord, watch this, Hezekiah prayed and Isaiah prayed. Isaiah was the prophet. Watch this. Then the Lord sent an angel. What do we see? An angel came down, showed the water, people were healed. But sometimes God sends an angel for a completely different purpose and different reason. Watch this, watch this. Who cut down every mighty man of valor, lead and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. Hezekiah just was on his knees with Isaiah praying and God was on the move by virtue of their prayer. When you pray, things will begin to move. You don't need to see them, but God is moving. Sometimes say, well, I don't see the result. God, let me tell your prayer. God is going to move in relation to your prayer. Oh, I wish I'm speaking. He says, watch this. Then the Lord sent an angel, one angel. One. I wish I'm speaking. I can't. You've got to get. You've got to get. Yeah. Send one angel, an angel. Okay. One angel, and he says, and cut, who cut down every mighty man of valor. Wow. Watch this. Leader and captain in the camp of the of of of, of the king of Assyria. So he returned shamefaced to his own land. Mm -hmm. He made him fled. That's Satan. He comes one way. He flees seven. He fled back, shamefully, back to his place. Defeated. Prayer defeats the enemy. Prayer empowers you. Prayer gives you breakthrough. Watch this, watch this. Do you want to see the extent of the devastation the angel had, that one angel had done? I'll show you. This is recorded. This is, this is recorded. The actual number of the people that he slew, the one angel, is recorded in the book of Isaiah, chapter 37. Watch this. In verse 36 says this. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Syrians 185,000. And when people rose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. One angel. And the angels are still moving, even today. <coughs> when an angel moves, things happen. Powerful things happen yes. in the world, praise God. Yes. You see, the thing is, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 24, by virtue of David's disobedience, God released the angel against his own people. Watch this, watch this. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 16 says, And when the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy, the Lord relented from destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, It is enough, now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana, uh, the Jeb Jebusites. Angels, are, people don't see this. At the last, before the consummation of time, there will be the release of mayhem, globally by the release of the angels activities that when an angel moves things begin to happen Amen. and just want to conclude by saying this do you know you all have guardian angels yes. let me tell you something there's angels watching your back let me tell you something Jesus himself, this is not my teaching, this is the biblical teaching, watch this. Jesus, I'm going to conclude with a few last thoughts. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. Take heed that you did not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. You've got people, you've got activity around you to protect. Psalm 34, verse 7 says, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. We have divine assistance. Amen. Let me qualify this, that we know that there is angel manifestation activity around our lives, praise God. And this is what this was not only confined to the Old Testament. 
uh, it's, 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 it's even now there is movement, angelic movement around in the world today, praise God. For example, Acts chapter 12, verse 13 says, And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate. Watch this. But ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. You get that when you get home. Angels are sent even to uh, strengthen us. Even the Lord himself had an angel intervene when he was in the garden of Gethsemane to strengthen him. Yeah? Angels come in so many forms, shapes, and sizes, in so many ways. Watch this. Luke 22, verse 42. I, as I said, I hope I'm not overrunning today, but I just wanted to drop this into your spirits. Praise God. Watch this. This is, this is Luke 22, verse 42, saying, Father, if it's not your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel, this is Jesus, with the power of the Holy Spirit, an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthen him. At the most time of your greatest despair, your greatest enemy, uh, your greatest uh, adversity, your lowest time in your life, angels can intervene in that darkness and uh, disperse the darkness and give you light of hope and strength if you just pray. And what was the key, what was the common thing between all of them? When the angels were moving, they were praying. Amen. You do your part and God will definitely do his part. You cannot outdo God and you cannot outgive God. Amen. Praise God. And it's not just in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament at the same time. And if we had time, I would expound a lot more. But just to say, when Herod, the, the king, the Roman emperor, he was taking glory from himself, the Lord sent an angel and struck him. This is Acts chapter 12, verse 21 to verse 24. So be encouraged today that you have more for you than those who are against you. Amen. You don't need to wait for the waters to serve because the waters now are in you, not just around you. Amen. And you have the man, as Pilate says, behold the man, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord to do more than you can ever imagine or think in order to guide you and safeguard you on your spiritual journey. So let's give the Lord a clap offering. <laughs> And in future weeks, perhaps on a Friday Bible study, I would discuss the different ranks of angelic orders and show you their mode of function and their interaction within the world and within each one of us. Perhaps that will be on a Friday Bible study. So God bless you. Let's stand together and we're going to pray. Hallelujah. Praise God. Your eminence, would you come and pray? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory be to God. 31 days of the month of January 2021. We are moving forward. Hallelujah. Say amen. amen. God has blessed us 31 days. All the pandemic. But let's learn something from the King Ezekiel's uh, story. Second Kings chapter 20, 21, 22. Talk about four kings. The first one was King Hezekiah, who prayed and challenged God, and God added 15 years to his life. But his son, Manasseh, became king at the age of 12, but he did not serve the God of Israel. He went on his way and served the God of Baal. And Manasseh's son, Amon, became king at the age of 20, and he did more worse than his father. But when Amon died, his son, Josiah, was eight years, but he came to serve the God of Israel. Amen. So the message has come, and it's your choice. It's your choice. When you meditate upon these words that are coming, it will bless you. It will empower you. The anointing of God will be upon your life. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but you fear no evil. Because God is in control. He's still on the throne. A lot of people have been calling me. You know, when people call me, 
Archbishop. Oh, Archbishop, take care of yourself. See, no more people are dying. And I, 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 yesterday I was telling them, how can you tell a medical doctor not to go to hospital? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's my ministry. And you know what? A, a, a Reverend Minister down brought up for last three days. And I was, she, they take care. When I was, I'm sitting down, the people are talking the negative. And I'm, I'm meditating that. You know, you don't you do, you do know the anointing I'm carrying. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes. Hallelujah. I did a service on the, on the 10th of December and the 11th of December at a West Ham Cemetery in Forest Gate. And almost five or ten people got COVID. I heard the story almost 12 days later. I heard that, oh, the service we did, there were a lot of people who were COVID. I'm, I'm covered by the blood. Yeah. So the spirit of fear. The young boy, a man who went to Ghana and died, the one who died the bread, the bread, yes. at 36 years, died instantly. And I learned the story yesterday that he died from anxiety. Yes. Not because of the COVID. Yes. But when he, he discovered, oh, I'm a person, how can I? So yesterday, that was the story I was being told. And throughout the Bible, they say, fear not. The Bible says 365 times in the Bible. So every day, God said, fear not. And align yourself to the Almighty God. Yes. And you see you through. Amen. You walk through the waters, rivers, and everything. You sail through every ocean. You will climb every mountain and you read the promised land of your business. Thank God. Hallelujah. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. disciples said take it this is my body then he took the cup up and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins god bless you in the name of the father son and the holy spirit As I mentioned earlier, we're having a 
ordination service starting at approximately 12 or so thereafter. If anyone is staying for the ordination who wants to remain, please stay in your seats and uh, you'll be guided as to how things will work from there. If you are leaving, then as normally you'll be directed, escorted out in the usual manner through the front. If you have your cups, you can dispose them at the door here as you leave. So just feel free, don't feel that you need to stay. If you have things you need to do, please leave in the, in the usual manner. So God bless you, we love you, and I thank for the testimonies, uh, Zoe and Haley's testimonies, and I thank you for your lives. And I will be praying later as well for some oil here. Some people ask that when they're all consecrated, so we pray for the oil to take it away to their families. It's an instruction that's been given by the Word of God, especially in the book of James. It says, if anyone has any ailments, any sickness, call for the elders, anoint them with oil. And the faithful prayer and the repentance will bring healing into people's lives. It's important. David says, anoint my head with oil. And my cup runneth over. There's, there's, there's a... There's a, there's a uh, a mystery behind oil, the move of God is represented in that old touch. It's, it's something, it's a quality, there's an element. In fact, oil has the, the, it, it's the nature of the oil is that if you put it in water, it always rises. And so that represents the anointing. The anointing always takes us up. And that's what it's about. So God bless you. I'm going to let the praise in close with one more song.
final prayer and benediction. Let's bow our heads. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If anyone else has actually bought oil and they want to bring it to the front, we're going to pray together collectively. If you have, or if you can bring, if you, some people have made requests, maybe next week if you want to bring your oil, praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for this day that you have made, that we are rejoicing and we are glad in it, Lord. We pray that you consecrate this oil, sanctify it, set it apart for divine mission and purpose. We know it's faith that brings healing. This is the symbol. You are the substance. We just commit this time to your hand as we just reach out now. prophets, kings, and priesthood, let your spiritual presence bring anointing, bring healing, bring protection, in Jesus' precious name, that this is just the point of contact, the same way the apron and the belts of Paul that people took, the handkerchiefs, and people were healed, I pray that that was the symbol, but the substance is our faith and your presence in our life. Just commit, release this anointing now, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus, bless your people, Lord. And bring us hope in the face of challenges. We just commit this time to you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. As Gethsemane means wine press, uh, olive press, Lord, we pray that our prayer, our sacrificial living, sacrificial prayers will bring healing into the nations and people's lives. We just commit this to you. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the church will say resounding. Amen. 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 God bless you. Let's lift up our hands in worship. Let's open our mouths and begin to give glory to God. Father, we thank you. Jehovah, King of Kings, Jehovah, Lord of Lords. The glory of all nations will lift your name on high. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for all the testimonies today. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful message of faith and hope in restoration. My Lord, my God, I also thank you for all the ministers and all the worshippers that are here this morning, this afternoon. Lord, we thank you for what you have done today. We thank you for what you're going to do for us in this new month that we are stepping into by faith. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, you've kept us through January, 31 days of the new year. Father, we return all the glory to you. Open your mouth wherever you're standing and worship you. Appreciate you. Father, we bless you. We give you glory. Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He that can do all things, the God of exceeding abundance. Father, we bless you. We give you all the praise. We thank you for our children that are here today. We thank you for our parents. We thank you for our brothers, our sisters. We thank you for all our loved ones. Father, we thank you for what you have been doing in our life. You have sustained us through 2020. 2020. You have also kept us in the first month of 2021. Father, we believe and we trust that you will keep us through the remaining days of 2021. We ask, Lord, for your hand to surround us. May your hand uphold us. May your hand sustain us. May your hand provide for us. Guide us through this year in Jesus' mighty name. Can everybody shout it loud? Amen. 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 Amen.
of your hands for Jesus. Take up the shaking, the king of kings. Appreciate the Lord the Lord. Appreciate the, the wonderful God, the exceeding abundant God. He that can do all things, there's nothing that is too hard for him. From the message that we had we had today, we can see that our God is more than able. Amen. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's share the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with each one of us now and forevermore. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us for the days of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. And let's give a mighty clap of praise.